another one of our podcasts. This is Hugh Waters over in Gloucestershire here and Phil, I think you're over in London town still? Yes, in the Route 6 workshop. Excellent. And today, this is just a quickie today, where um, Phil had a day out. He was allowed out from work and he went to he went to find out a bit more about what was HD Masters. But but things have moved on. It's no longer called HD Masters, Phil. No, that's that's right. This is this little um, this little one day. Well, it used to be a two day. It's a one day conference now in London. It was held at BAFTA. Um, a re- really nice venue, you know, nice, nice um, set um, and uh, in the past it's just been called HD Masters but of course now we're very very used to HD and all that kind of stuff I think last year it might have been called 3D Masters um, uh, but, but 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 it was just all the manufacturers of, of greater than HD resolution um, equipment and uh, and it's a funny mix of manufacturers and broadcasters and kind of other you know resellers and people like that um, uh, and 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 so you get some funny things. And one of the things that really interested me was the um, a, a lot of what drives these people is sales of television sets. And apparently, um, panels peaked in 2010. Um, they sold 51 million uh, panels in Europe in 20, 2010. Good grief! Um, but it's just been a linear drop off since then. So they sold 30 million panels in Europe last year. And the worry is that that. Um, you know, you know, a nice, uh, a nice HD capable panel should last you ten years, and and if it's going to last everybody ten years, the market's saturated. Why is anybody going to buy another panel? And kind of three D has been a disappointment. Um, you know, lots of people bought three D tellies. In fact, you, you're hard pushed not to buy, um, a, you know, a non three D telly nowadays. Um, uh, and 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 people were obviously you know, early adopters were disappointed they bought seven twenty p tellies. So I think people are very wary now of of. Of um, investing in new equipment, stung too many times. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and and why on earth should I waste my money on on a three D telly? Um, you know, when when there's no really no content for it, it's not very compelling anyway. Um, I've got up a picture of um, of Samsung's um, uh, uh, booth at um, NAB this year, and they were showing some four K hundred inch tellies. I mean, these things are monstrous. You, you, you know, the, not very many people could fit one of these in their house. Um, and that's the other driver, isn't it? Why on earth do you want tellies? I mean, when I was a kid, you know, a 21-inch telly was considered a big telly. Um, yeah. And now 32 really is the starting point, and uh, you know, 55-inch seems to be the kind of thing that if you've got any amount of money to spend, you, you spend on a telly. Um, I suppose what's going to happen is that the, the television is actually going to change eventually from the thing that we watch in the room to being a part of the actual room itself, one whole wall, I suppose. But... Uh, well, possibly, but the thing I heard everybody say, everybody but everybody say, was uh, my kids don't watch telly, and I can I can yeah. I can testify to that. That's my true. children don't watch; they don't sit down and watch the television anymore. They they, they watch iPlay, they watch lots of YouTube. They you know they they get their, their their media from lots of different places, but they're either watching it on a laptop or on a tablet, or on their telephone. Uh, and, yes. and it's very it's rare too. for my for my kids to actually watch the television. Um, and uh, you know you know what what a surprise kind of thing. Um, so. Uh, but, but, but but you know we're web broadcast engineers. We've, we've got to be concerned about all this stuff. And 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 so I thought we did we sort of kick off by going over some of the sort of the, 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 the standards that are, that are now governing, um, uh, you know this new um, uh, 4K stroke 8K television. Sometimes yeah. referred to as ultra high definition television. Uh, you, so you that hit- always makes me laugh because I remember HD was once 405 line. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a great plaque which I, I, I use a photograph of in some of my presentations for work, where, where uh, at um, at um, Ali Pali, uh, where where the 405 line service started by the BBC in 1937, and uh, yeah, high definition television started here. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 um, so so everybody's talking about 4K or or Quad HD. You hear that sometimes mentioned sometimes, yeah. and it's it's or UHD. Ultra high definition television one, whereas UHD TV two will be 8K television. Um, the, the the thing to bear in mind is that these resolutions are well, they're either 340 by 2160, so four times the resolution of our 1920 by 1080 HD, or they're 760, 7680, 7680 pixels across the the width of the screen by um, by 4320 pixels deep and um, lines of video. Um, uh, uh, but, but they're different resolutions to what people are traditionally using for film production, which is 4096 pixels wide or 8192 pixels wide. So if you're shooting something on a on a, uh, a 4K camera, you're not shooting at these UHD TV 
type resolutions. You're shooting at the slightly ah. higher res film standard. But you know, as equipment um, generally speaking adapts to the the, the, the standard nowadays, isn't it? It's not like the old days when it was either PAL or NTSC. Everything works with everything. And um, the, the the thing I thought was very interesting. So so uh, uh, EBU Rec six, sorry EBU Rec twenty twenty is the standard that covers this. We seem to have gone. We seem to have jumped from uh, seven oh nine to uh, to uh, twenty twenty very quickly. You know. Yes, which is all the others. Yeah, you know, all the standards in between. <laughs> but um, uh, one of the interesting things is, and I've got a picture of the the seven oh nine color space up at the moment, yeah. um, which shows our the color space that we use for television nowadays with the D sixty five as our white point right in the middle mm -hmm. there, and the, and the and the triangle which shows that the gamut, the color gamut of television. And uh, uh, but if we look at the uh, the, uh, the 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 rec twenty twenty color space, which I've just overlaid on top of that, um, the triangle is monstrous. It almost reaches to the limits of human color perception as defined by the CIE nineteen thirty one chart. Um, there's only a few um, greens that don't come into this new color triangle, and it's even bigger than the P3 uh, Digital Cinema Initiative, the DCI color space. Uh, so, uh, so this is something for the future. This is something that we won't see on domestic televisions, I think, for probably 10 years. The ability to, you know, cover this whole range of colors that are now proposed. Um, so, so the, the the proposal actually covers beyond what we can actually manufacture at the moment. Uh, yeah, for sure, yeah. And in fact, um, uh, it also we we also find ourselves with a, a new set of colour primaries, uh, which I've I've just got the values up on screen for. They obviously relate back to the CIE chart. Uh, a new white point definition. Mm -hmm. No, it's not a new white, white point definition. It's exact. It's, it's D sixty five. It's exactly the same what we're used to. And the the, the Luma transfer function. Um, you know the the uh, the, um, the, um, the the formula that's used to derive. Uh, the, the, the monochrome Luma signal from the R, G, yeah. and B. And this brings us to something which I was kind of aware of for a long time. Um, there's a guy called Charles, Charles Poynton. He's a very famous um, broadcast engineer in the States. Um, uh, you know, sort of thinker on on on, um, on, on colorimetry and things like that. And uh, he, he's had this sort of bee in his bonnet for many years about constant luminance. So if you think about the way a television camera derives that Y, C, B, C, R, you know, luminance and two color difference signals currently, it does it yeah. from the RGB um, uh, signals that come out of the three color pickup sensors, the three CCDs. Um, and, but, but having had the gamma of the system, you know, that nonlinear response applied to the RGBs before the luminance is derived. And, and Charles says, no, 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 this is a terrible way to go about things. You should derive the gamma once you've, once you've derived the luminance signal. And, and just, 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 it's worth backing up because the, the gamma, was itself a kludge. It's it was there to to get over. If I've understood it correctly, was was to get over the nonlinearity of the original CRTs. Is that right? Or? Absolutely. So CRTs don't have a constant kind of uh, signal in light out relationship. We, we use a gamma of two point two, which is that sort of classic kind of curve that That's isn't right. isn't the straight line of signal in light out. We've got this classic kind of gamma curve of two point two. If you plot it on a graph, that says. So that meant that meant when you put. Um, let's say, uh, a low voltage in to represent a, a dark grey, you didn't get twice as much when you doubled that voltage. You got a... Exactly. And in fact, it works It works in the favour of a television system because because the, the, the gamma concentrates a lot more of the, of the dynamic range of the signal down in the low end. It means you get a lot more um, uh, colour differentiation, a lot, lot more um, luminance differentiation down in the low end and consequently uh, a bit, bit better noise performance in the low end, which traditionally is where the tubes of old school television cameras suffered. So, 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 I, I, see, it seems like almost a philosophical thing, you know, for for Poynton about constant luminance. I, I don't really understand where the differences are. He claims that there are tiny color errors that are introduced by applying the gamma at the RGB stage rather than applying it at the luminance stage. And I haven't done enough research to know whether we still even need gamma in television. Whether, whether LCDs and OLEDs and plasmas and projectors even require it anymore i'm sure the manufacturer applies a matrix at the last point before they display the color on their display device be it an lcd or an, an oled or whatever um, but i don't know whether whether gamma is even necessary anymore you know yes it does strike me as if it's something which is um it's a bit of a largish hammer you know we've got so many so many possibilities for shaping uh, the signal in any way we want as we deliver it to whatever device 
even during the course of delivery. Um, so why do you need this one constant that d doesn't change? Yeah, so like you say, we've, we've got a few tiny little hammers at the right places that are sorting this out. Why do we still yeah. need gamma hammer? Anyway, um, you know... But we do, and it is there. Something to ponder. Um, the, the, the other thing that, that came out is, is that um, obviously all the, all the people you can buy equipment from at the moment for 4K have sat very firmly on the on the 30 frames per second uh, progressive 30 progressive frames per second and in fact uh, ultra high definition television doesn't even allow for interlaced which is nice that we're moving away from that um, but so if you think about um, ultra high definition television at 4k that's that's four um, times the resolution of regular HD so if, if regular HD is 1.5 gigabits per second going down the cable then you'd think if you could multiplex those all together it would be a six gigabit per second signal for four times the resolution if all you wanted was 30 frames a second most and in fact that's right. what black magic are hawking that's all all their products mm -hmm. that support 4k are they're calling it 6g 6g isn't yet a ratified standard by the ebu or the smpte so, so, so they've kind of you know they, they're kind of flying solo really you know it, it works between black magic products but who knows how f much further it'll go but right, okay. so 6g kind of covers the very basic end of 4k um, but um, one of the one of the really interesting presentations was a chap called Richard Salmon, who's a BBC um, engineer, and the experiments they've been doing between the BBC and the NHK, they've discovered that because you have kind of so much more resolution at 4K, um, imagine a, a camera panning across a, uh, a, a crowd in a, in a sports stadium. Uh, you know, as the camera's panning, if you've only got 30 frames per second of temporal resolution, then um, by definition, the, 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 every single pixel is going to be a bit smeared. You know, every single yeah. bit of detail in the picture is going to be a bit smeared because the camera was moving for quite a lot. You know, for, for a long time, a thirtieth of a second. Um, but when the camera lands on a, on a, a still shot, um, all of a sudden, your your brain is aware of, of how much resolution is there. The fact that you can see, you know, great detail in people's faces. You can see lots and lots of resolution, which you're not used to on a on a edge on a detail display. suddenly comes flying out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and and they've discovered that that at 4K and 8K, people actually feel nauseous when they get this effect of the panning oh, yeah. camera looks much like an old standard definition television picture. As it settles, you suddenly get you're aware of loads and loads of resolution. It's the difference between what they call static resolution and dynamic resolution. I've got a, a, one of oh, Richard's please. slides up at the moment that shows the difference in standard definition terms, which is not offensive. And apparently, at the the higher you go up, you know, in higher definition terms, the more offensive it becomes. And he's got some still frame grabs, a video shot at 50 uh, frames per second and 300 frames per second, and they they played us some on the big projector in BAFTA there, and it really did look splendid. The stuff that was shot at, mm -hmm. you know, greater than 100 frames a second looked brilliant. And so the proposal is that for ultra-high definition television, we really do need 120 frames per second, at least, for it to look nice so for live production. Um, so we're talking about uh, the HD standard at the moment uh, stops at 30. Um, 30 frames a second, is that right? Yes, yeah, well, so, so the 1080p, 60 maximum of 60 progressive frames per second is what we have at the moment. So we can have 60 frames okay. per second at HD, and that goes down to yeah. 3G cable, which we're kind of all used to. It's a it's an HD cam SR recording on a 5800 video recorder, if you will. And so then um, the Blackmagic 4K uh, 6G, is that right, it is, is capped at, is that 30 frames a second? That tops out at 30 progressive frames a second for 4K, yeah. But that gets you this slightly nauseous, uh, or possibly even very nauseous, uh, effect. That you can now see the difference between the temple uh, and static resolutions. Yes. So the smear suddenly goes sharp, goes smeary, goes sharp, uh, and that's going to be upsetting. So where does that fit in with um, the the visual difference in in uh, forty eight fps that the Hobbit was shot in. Well, okay, so, so the Hobbit was shot, I believe, on red Epic cameras. Uh, so, so this is this is entirely kind of film file based. So, so, so there's no suggestion that there's any kind of HDSDI to move this stuff around. You know, it comes off the camera on a on a on a portable recorder. Um, you know, as as a bunch of DPX files. No, no, no as a bunch of red red code files. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so in a sense, you know. Um, that's the, the, a lot of what they talked about um, at BAFTA w was was concerning live production, so you know sports okay, stadiums. Okay, so, so like put that. that to one so, side. So we really have to do think about how do we move these things around on cables. So 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 there we go. If if we're saying we want 4K not at 30 frames per second, which we can just about send down a BNC cable and we'll call it 6G, 
yeah. but we want to do it at 120 frames a second, four times the frame rate. We're now looking at 24G, 24 gigabits per second down a piece of coaxial cable. Um, and uh, it probably won't be a bit of coaxial cable. It'll probably be a bit of fiber cable, a bit of single mode fiber. Um, but I've just popped up on, on, on screen uh, some research I did uh, sort of three, three years ago concerning 3G down coaxial cable. And uh, yes. it's, it's, it's just a load of eye patterns, basically, that show you what damage is done to a 3G signal as, as the cable length increases. And we, we kind of concluded, and we, we've applied the same standard for all our installations, that at 60 meters per sec, at 60 meters, using the highest quality coaxial cable, you're just on the point of, uh, of your um, signal um, starting to have too many errors that aren't recoverable. Yeah. So, you know, as every superhero knows, um, you, you know, you, you, you double the data rate, you kind of have to really half the cable length. So at 24G, you know, we're looking at, you know, at best 10, 15 meters of cable at best. That's unusable, really, you know, for, for a coaxial standard. So it does seem that, you know, for any contemporary 4K television system that will be adopted, we won't be looking at coaxial cable. We'll look at, be looking at fiber optic cable. Okay. Um, and, and, and that's still in the, the YCBCR color space. If we want to go for RGB, it's going to be even bigger, 36G for 4K and 120-something G for, for 8K. It's just untenable, really. Um, but what that also brings to us is this idea that maybe uh, we won't be just sending things around as pixels. We'll have to have some sort of mezzanine format. And we'll talk about that in, in, in just a little short while because I wanted to kind of wrap up the whole sort of discussion of, of cable standards with just a reference to HDMI. Because obviously HDMI is the domestic oh, yeah. standard. You, you know, that's how you get things out of your Blu-ray yeah. player into your telly or from your set-top box into your telly. And... Um, uh, yeah, so HDMI 1.4, which is the current standard that's with us, that, that, that tops out at about eight gigabits per second and so it does support 4k at 30 frames a second so it supports like a very sort of um you know slimmed down version of 4k um but but hdmi 2 apparently extends much much further and and, and really mimics some of the developments in display port technology so that will take us all the way up to high 20s so it's the thought the thinking is that hdmi 2 will support um uh, 4k at those greater than 100 frames per second frame rates so it's kind but of, quite short cable runs. I mean, these, these are sort of two or three meters max. Yeah, set top box to telly, you know, yeah, topping out typically at no more than 10 meters, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, with all that kind of monstrous data, um, data load in mind, um, the, 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 the next um, uh, presentation that really caught my uh, eye was by this chap called Professor Philip Willis, who's a computer graphics um, uh, guy at Bath University. Just got his uh, personal... Um, page up from Bath University and uh, he was a very engaging speaker and uh, he talked a lot about pixel free and even frame free video you think, well, hang on hang on how can this you, is this is pretty exciting you know this is how can, how can you capture video without without chopping up into line pixels <laughs> and lines and, and, and frames and such but he showed a system that they've been developing for um, uh, a few years now and uh, I'm just going to play a YouTube clip and um, so what we're seeing here is his codec takes, um, if I'll pause it to, to, to slightly explain it a bit better, his codec takes um, the pixels of, of a video clip, and it doesn't matter what resolution, and it transforms them into a series of contours uh, and, and vectors. So contours are continuous mathematical descriptions of surface edges and how they're shaded, and then the vectors describe how they're moving. So there's kind of elements of how MPEG works, how the macro blocks move in MPEG, but he has essentially done away with any reference to resolution within each frame of video. He's just got continuous contours. The upshot of this is that you basically render the image at the resolution you choose, and because these were all vectors and contours describing the image and the shading of the various parts of the image... And that's an important part, the shading, because that's the vectors are just lines or points being connected, but yes. the shading is what goes in between. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's, what, what, that's what was puzzling me, I see, yes. That's what makes pictures pictures as opposed to line drawings, yeah. yeah. Now, um, I've, I've paused it on a, on, on a, a frame showing um, a clip from a, a, a soft drink commercial, and, uh, and, and, and the screen has been chopped in half, and... Uh, on, on, on the right hand side of the screen they've just rendered the contours and vectors as if they were video so you can kind of see what it looks like yeah. inside the codec 
that's quite an interesting sort of image. Yeah. And and uh, apparently, so far, they've made no efforts to to make this a compression system. There's no suggestion that this will. Um, uh, reduce the data load of video but it is a way of divorcing video from pixels and so and so you could imagine that this technology would be incorporated into the camera and we'd just be distributing this data stream around the place that describes the pictures so we could then render yeah. them and presumably presumably you, you can you can do with with the right um uh with the right um processing you could do grading you could do effects you could do lots of stuff in, sorts of in this amazing and manipulations yeah vector um uh contour domain you don't have to render it back to pixels to do those things and you'd only render it back to pixels when it landed at a display device um that's kind of i think that's kind of a really kind of fundamental um change in the way that that, that telly will work um and uh the, the, the tantalizing little thing that the prof professor yeah. said at the end of his talk was, oh, and we're also investigating making contours and vectors uh, non-time dependent so that they work across time as well as per frame of video. So we could divorce video from even having frames. So you could shoot something oh, wow. which is entirely resolution less and frame rate less. And then, you know, you render it at the correct resolution and the correct um, uh frame rate for the for the display device that you're watching it on and so all of a sudden um uh standards conversion disappears uh, and and um you know up resing down resing disappears you, you know everything's kind of gone it's all just as good as it can be and the other upshot of this is that and um, because everything's described in curves and vectors and and shading when you of course you can't get more detail than was shot by the camera on the day but when you do up res things they don't they don't alias in the way that up video does where you get jaggies and stuff like that yes. you know edges remain smooth uh, 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 and and so it it produces up images that are pleasing compared to up images of standard definition to high definition where at best it's always a bit of a it's a, it's a bit of a bodge and, and that shot looks very yes, soft when you zoom you know. into yeah exactly when you zoom into something on a, in a pixelated image the best that can do is is produce steppy jaggy corners whereas if you know that it's a curve from here to here and you zoom into it well it's still a curve from here to here if in real life when you did zoom into it there was more detail well you won't get that because you didn't shoot it but at least you'll get a pleasing curve um so it'll, it would be much more accessible to a human eye yeah much better for sure i'm, I'm just popping Absolutely. up the the, 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 the prof's uh, paper that talks about all this and it's surprisingly accessible actually um, the, the yes, because you did you did your, um, your your degree in in maths, didn't you? Uh, maths so and is, programming, is, is, yeah. And I did I did my yeah. final year in, in graphics, yeah. And and was it having looked at the maths, it didn't look like it was all that heavyweight. If you're comfortable with vector with vector maths, uh, then it's just fine. And and actually, I mean, I've I've given a very poor um, description about it because because the contours are, are actually have hierarchies. So so. So you know, if, if you've kind of if you know anything about computer graphics, that's that's not a, a hard concept to get into. And um, lots of lots of um, uh, particularly volume mapping uh, systems use hierarchies um, for for that kind of stuff. So none of this is is kind of harder than A level maths, I would say. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's remarkably accessible. He's, he's he's done a very good job of explaining it, and he was a, a fantastic uh, presenter. You know, if you, if you get the chance to see this, I'd encourage you to. Uh, well, yeah, you, you know, you can grab all the presentations fr from the uh, from the um, from the Beyond HD Masters website. Um, so that's it's, it's well worth looking at. And uh, Excellent. Uh, so I thought it was a splendid day. Uh, uh, there, there were some real points of of sort of technological ha ha. So that's how they'll do it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there was an awful lot of um, the manufacturers just being sort of sore about the fact that tellys aren't selling as well. The, the thing I heard from several manufacturers, which I just couldn't believe, was, of course, 4K will be the saviour of 3D. And I just kept thinking to myself, surely, you know, the loss of vertical resolution wasn't the problem with 3D. It was the fact that you've yeah. got to put glasses on, which breaks the paradigm of, of casual television watching. That's what killed yeah. 3D, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think we're there with 3D. I think it, I think it was um, something of a hoodwink, which which hasn't worked really. So, well, I mean, yeah. the, 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 the the more cynical people say, you know, kind of it, it comes around, it comes around every sort of thirty years, 
you know, it was, yeah. it was anaglyph back in the sixties, and, and you know, it kind of came round again. And but but the, the, there was there was a company showing an, a modified LG panel that, that had that was the glasses free um, uh, 3D uses lenticular a lenticular um, you know Fresnel lens incorporated into the display, yeah. and if you got your head just in the right place, the 3D effect was kind of okay. It wasn't as compelling say as Dolby Cinema 3D is, uh, but. But as soon as you kind of relaxed your head and you moved off axis a tiny bit, you were aware of, of chromatic distortions around the edges of things and stuff. So, you know, I think even Glasses 3 3D. And until you can get what R2-D2 does in Star Wars yes. and project a little picture of Princess Leia in free space in front of him, I don't think 3D is ever going to hit. <laughs> well, there we are. So it was a very worthwhile uh, day. Fascinating. And I just love this idea of... Uh, losing the frame rates and losing the pixel resolutions and just moving to the new mathematical way of simply describing the curvature and it just just seems more honest shading. doesn't it and fantastic it, and yes it, it does and in one, in one sense i suppose it's the reverse of what things like postscript do you know, like you, you look at a pdf and it's taken a vector yeah. description of a page and turned it back into a raster for you this is the reverse of that it takes the raster turns it back into a vector description of the image very interesting so SVG, here we come. Is that the idea? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. scalable vector well, video. Yes, SVG. Yeah. Well, thank you, Phil. Fascinating for a short one. I don't know what the next uh, podcast's topic is. Have we thought uh, of a couple? Uh, well, um, the, the, two things I've, I've kind of got bubbling. Uh, one is 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 homebrew hardware part two, Raspberry Pi and uh, Netium uh, network control boards, uh, or. Um, uh, this thing I've been banging on about a lot for the last year, um, uh, the Amulet KVM over IP system, which oh, yeah. obviously you, yeah. you, you've been sort of looking at professionally for a job you're working on. So uh, maybe, yes, maybe talk a bit about that. We should get young James to, to talk about it. Yep, get, get, uh, as, get the uh, hunter see. in. That'd be good, yeah. Yes, James is the engineer I've been working with on, on a project, which is what uh, we've just been mentioning. Right, excellent. Well, thank you, Phil. Jolly and, good. Uh, that's Speak to you soon, I suppose. Back, back to Call of Duty with your young man. Back to Call of Duty, yes. I've, I, Dad, he said, you're absolutely hopeless. <laughs> oh, well. I'll see you there soon, chap. Have. And you, bye. Take it easy.